Our, our next speaker, uh, Professor Davor Jalta, uh, from the um, Stockholm um, University, uh, Stockholm School of Theology. Uh, he has many hats, so he's an artist, a philosopher, a theologian. Um, so currently he occupies uh, two roles, professor of religion and art, as well as the president of the Institute for the Study of Culture and Christianity. Uh, before uh, Stockholm, he was um, professor in the American Institute of Rome. Davar is a prolific writer. He has uh, 12 books which he had either authored or edited in Serbian and English. And the topic of one of his book is very relevant to this conference, The Human Work of Art, a Theological Appraisal of Creativity and the Death of the Artist. It was published by St. Vladimir's uh, Press in 2014. So Davar will speak about creativity beyond arts. Thanks. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you very much and thanks for the invitation uh, to come here and talk at this beautiful conference. This presentation uh, has gone through a couple of different stages. First, I didn't want to have actually a PowerPoint. And then when Irina heard that I wouldn't have a PowerPoint with some images, she was very sad. So then I decided to make a PowerPoint. And then I listened to these presentations this morning. And then I thought about just forgetting about my presentation and offering some comments on many inspiring topics that we have heard. But then in the end, let, let me uh, show you some of those uh, slides that I uh, prepared. So. Uh, we always associate creativity with art, as we could have heard from presentations both yesterday and, and today. Uh, so I actually want to talk about a little bit that connection. How did it happen that we started thinking of the sphere of art as the sphere where creativity somehow in its purest form happens, as opposed to just a novel arrangement of pre-existing things. So we generally think about uh, art as this sphere of authentic creation. Uh, and although we use the concept of creativity nowadays in many different contexts, uh, we talk about creative cooking and creative management and all sorts of other creative things, we still somehow reserve uh, this purest concept of creativity for the sphere of art. And that is also how sometimes in, a, in theological contexts, uh, creativity has been understood as something that appears, human creativity as something that appears in its purest form somehow in the field of art. So just offering a couple of uh, lines from Nikolai Berdyayev, of course, my, uh, a, great, a great admirer of his work. So this presentation will basically circulate around these two questions. Why do we think of creation, creativity as being somehow naturally linked to the uh, field of art? And I'll try to show you that actually there is nothing terribly natural about it. And of course, how can uh, taking creation creativity seriously be helpful in a theological enterprise? What can theology do with uh, the concept of creation that's not necessarily linked, at least uh, not the way we usually do that with the sphere of art? So the first question, of course, there to explore is what do we mean when we say art? Uh, yesterday we heard about one concept of techne or techni, equivalent to Latin ars, and today we heard about a couple of other concepts that can be used uh, in order to explain things like make, create, form, and stuff like that. And of course, these concepts have been used for a very long time, but it's not, strictly speaking, what we mean when we nowadays uh, 
uh, or over the last couple of hundreds of years uh, mean when we say art primarily in the modern Western context. Uh, for all of you who have not seen this movie and you're interested in the issues such as contemporary art and uh, all sorts of ways of conceptualizing art, I suggest you to uh, see this uh, movie which talks primarily about the contemporary art world but goes through many of those dialogues through all the most important points of the most influential theories of art over the last 200, 250 years. Uh, so it's about two brothers. One is a commercial uh, painter whose works sell very well. Uh, and he's interested in concepts of beauty and aesthetics and stuff like that. And the other brother is an avant-garde artist who actually uh, objects to these from the perspective that all of that, such an understanding of art has primarily to do with the Western ideological uh, context of Western modernity, which uh, has to do with all sorts of other things, not just aesthetics and not just beauty as we usually understand it as something that somehow is divorced from broader social and ideological concerns. And that actually uh, leads us to uh, some of these, I'll just give you a couple of bullet points. Uh, there are many of them, I apologize for that in advance, but we can then later on discuss more in depth about uh, those that you find most interesting or relevant. Uh, the first one is, of course, art as an aesthetic phenomenon that has to do with our feelings, sensory experiences, beauty, self-expression, and so on. This, of course, is not uniquely modern. Uh, people in previous times also used to think of what we nowadays call artworks as something that uh, has to do with aesthetics and beauty. But what is uh, new in this context, and I'll go back to this, is the understanding that this beauty related to art is somehow autonomous, can be somehow uh, taken out of other contexts such as religious, political, and so on. And this art works in an institutional context that we usually call a world of art or art world, which is something that was created in the West at the beginning of the period we call modern. Something like that never existed before. So in this context, there is a whole set of institutions and procedures that go together with what we simply call art, they are typical of Western modernity, such as museum galleries uh, and so on. Finally, nowadays, people would argue that when we go to those institutions that we are used to as institutions that deal with this art and creation in some kind of pure form, uh, that actually we primarily deal nowadays with uh, art as art market. That it is not any longer this classical modernist preoccupation with beauty or creativity as such, but primarily as something that in itself uh, came to be immersed in a capitalist or neoliberal capitalist system, just as some would argue everything else. And one comment upon that is uh, famous Maurizio Catalan's work, America, which has had an interesting history from 2016. I won't go into that. But it is a functioning toilet, as you can see, uh, which was initially created and placed in the Guggenheim Museum of Art in New York. Uh, you, you can use it. All the visitors can use it. Uh, and the only difference from normal other toilets is that it's made of solid gold. It was made before and then it was stolen. It had an interesting, interesting story. Uh, but you can see here a couple of interesting comments that Maurizio Catalans was making with this uh, work, uh, pointing to this class uh, divide that 
we constantly need to be aware of when we talk about high culture or art and its social dimension. And this is accentuated here with just this gold. It's uh, the only place actually, was the only place where regular people can see that amount of solid gold in one place, encounter it uh, and use it. Then art as gold, uh, art as something that has a value in itself, even aesthetic value, and here Catalan also plays with that. Some argue, some commentators on contemporary art uh, already said that actually the, the aesthetic value of this work uh, comes to front only fully when you use it, because then you have all the glittering effects that otherwise are not necessarily there or accentuated in the same way. And finally, it functions as a reversal for those of you who are familiar with the history of 20th century art of Marcel Duchamp and his famous work from 1917. Uh, uh, his urinal uh, called the fountain uh, where a fully functioning object was taken or potentially functioning object was taken out of its regular surrounding and uh, the context of a restroom and placed into a gallery context and thus defunctionalized, turned into an artwork. What Catalan is doing here is actually reversing the strategy, uh, kind of placing an artwork with all the special qualities to make it usable again, but of course in a very, in a very different, different environment. Uh, so this is just to point to that the concept of art actually is a highly ideologically charged uh, concept. It is not something that can be, at least since uh, the beginning of Western modernity, uh, understood as neutral in any meaningful sense. Uh, we talk about autonomy of art, we talk about modern subjectivity individualism in, in this context, but actually what is important is that this autonomy is proclaimed, but actually it's never there. Art as art or pure art always works also as an ideological agent. Uh, we have this invention of the aesthetic in the 18th century, which came up with this idea that aesthetics somehow refers to an autonomous sphere, just as religion has its own sphere or science has its own sphere and so on and so forth. So this comparatization of, 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 of human activities and, and, and social sphere is also something that Western modernity tried to apply to the sphere of art, claiming that there is such a thing as autonomy, autonomous sphere of art. And the problem with that is, of course, that this autonomous sphere was used and still is being used for ideological and political purposes. So the danger of that is that it's not used as a political tool. It is used as something that claims its autonomy to be neutral, emptied of a priori ideological uh, contents. You all heard about the idea of la pour art for the sake of art, but actually this art for art's sake is in itself an ideological concept. Uh, and we can, of course, go into many different directions there, talk about how this fits with the broader uh, elements of modernity in the West uh, with the Enlightenment project and the role of reason and how reason tried, or at least a certain definition of reason, tried to uh, monopolize all of these different spheres and designate proper places to all of them. But one consequence of that was that this aesthetic realm was divorced from other realms, including the realm of truth. And this is something that we haven't had in previous times. Aesthetics, aesthetic elements were previously uh, engaged with various spheres truth, religion, metaphysics, uh, social, and other, other functions. And they were manifested as paintings or sculptures or anything else 
within that context. Modern aesthetics came with the idea that it is a separate sphere, and as a separate sphere, it can have its own truth, but it cannot claim to be somehow connected with metaphysics or truth that were reserved for uh, philosophy or natural philosophy and then ultimately science, which is quite a change, quite an interesting and important change and we go back and reflect about how that affects creativity. There are some interesting conclusions to draw. Um, and one example where you can see how this proclaimed autonomous aesthetics actually has had very practical political roles is the role of art in the creation of modern nations, for example, where you claim that you build a museum which is just an art museum where you just go to experience aesthetics and beauty of artworks, but actually the purpose of that experiencing beauty in that context and all institutions like national museums is to contribute to building uh, a new concept of nation uh, as, of course, an ideological construct. Uh, this is also what you can see in many of the ideological projects of the 20th centuries, of the 20th century, that even though they were coming from opposite ideological camps, could have utilized this idea of pure art, formalist art, for their purposes. We also have in this context the concept of genius, which was a way uh, for 18th century aesthetics to say how this quality of beauty comes to be. How it's possible that it's created as something with all these elements that I talked about, autonomy and uh, inspiration, all of that. So then we talk about genius and creative imagination as something ever since 18th century, something that's produced within this sphere, within the sphere of art. And normally up until the period of postmodernity, the idea was that only certain individuals, only those with so-called talent are capable of actually producing good art and creating something in an authentic way. Uh, other people, you know, can enjoy that, can appreciate that, but cannot themselves necessarily be creators. Uh, and to end this ideological uh, story about art or how art can function as an ideological project, I refer again to the movie uh, from the beginning where there is this one line that actually participating in art market, participating in this world of art is a way of participating in creating the history of the Western civilization. So think about, think about that. Uh, now I would like to, uh, with this as a background, to move to what can we do with the concept of creativity in a theological context. So the purpose of all this presentation so far was to tell you that actually there is something highly questionable at least uh, with the idea that authentic creation happens within the sphere of art. That sphere of art as such can never be actually divorced from its social, political, ideological class, all other uh, implications. Uh, but that of course doesn't mean that we should sacrifice the concept of creativity. And part of my own approach to art theory was to say that in spite of the fact that I think that postmodern critique of many of the modern modernist constructs, such as the concept of authorship, genius, uh, all this class division uh, that we find in the sphere of art was right, but that it doesn't necessarily mean that we should sacrifice the concept of creativity. Uh, what can rather be done is to think of creativity as something that goes beyond the sphere of art, not just as a, some kind of lower quality creativity of something that doesn't reach the splendid heights of uh, 
creativity in the sphere of art, but rather as something that is a fundamental property of who we are as human beings. And when you take a look, turn to theology and uh, see how theology has traditionally articulated uh, the concept of creativity, it has traditionally been linked with the sphere of art. And that is the reason why we very often talk about um, theological aesthetics, where theology discusses various concepts in the context of aesthetics, but really about theology of creativity as something that appreciates human creative capacities as such, as part of who we are as, as human beings. So that would be my uh, first suggestion to actually uh, those who are of course interested in that, to pay more attention to creation and creativity beyond the modern concept of art. And this is my critique against some contemporary approaches in Orthodox theology that uncritically uh, go for just merging theology of creativity with modern artistic uh, sentiments. So I think it can be a very productive dialogue, but if we don't keep in mind the whole context out of which our modern con uh, concept of creativity and uh, in its relation with art came from, uh, there are many dangers there, including one of them that we will be uh, using theology to sustain some of those ideological narratives, not to actually deconstruct them. Uh, that means that appreciating creativity and human creative potentials should and can go beyond the sphere of aesthetics, but also beyond the sphere of this institutional framework in which we are used to look for creativity, like galleries, museums, and the whole network of art institutions that we find nowadays, not only in Western societies, but also globally. Uh, theological appreciation of human creativity is, especially in the Orthodox context, a pretty new area. Uh, the above mentioned Nikolai Berijayev was so far the one who, in the most profound sense, as far as I'm aware, uh, Pose the question of human creativity. And actually, his critique of the theological and philosophical practice up to that point was to say that we were, and we still are, in many cases, so much preoccupied with the question of sin, obedience, suffering also, that Berejaev's argument is so little attention was paid to the positive side of human being and human active response to God and God's call, human creative response. For a very long time, theology relied on the old patristic idea that creatures cannot create. There are occasionally some references to creation, mostly allegorically, but the idea remained and informed profoundly Christian theology, both East and West, that creatures cannot create. God creates ex nihil, and what we can do as human beings is just to refashion it in some way. We can just rearrange what's already there, but since we cannot create matter itself, we cannot authentically, fully authentically create. And that was questioned by Nikolai Berdyaev, and in his philosophy we have an example how one can, some would claim from a philosophical perspective, I would also claim from a theological perspective, how we can engage with uh, the question of creativity, uh, not as an aesthetic uh, category alone, but as something that has profound implications as to our anthropology. Uh, in that context, creativity can be seen as part of Imago Dei. In a curious, uh, it, it's curious that the uh, theology and Orthodox theology neglected this aspect 
and we can of course talk about uh, social and historical conditions that 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 uh, have been behind this uh, overlooking of creativity. We talk about human freedom in the context of Imago Dei, the human being is the image of God. We talk about human rational capacities, but you rarely hear about human creativity as being part of Imago Dei. And it seems strange because one of the things, fundamental things, how Christians building on the Old Testament tradition think of their God is that he's the creator. He's someone who brings things out of nothing. And the purpose of that, at least that's my argument, has been to say that God is free. So the fact that he creates the world means he is free. He is ontologically free, we could say. Uh, his being does not depend on something else. Uh, if we take seriously the idea of human freedom, it seems to me that that's not possible without taking seriously also the idea that human beings, in some sense at least, are capable of authentic creation. And Benjai would say, uh, it, it's not working. Yeah. Well. Yeah, but that doesn't work either. Can you hear me still? Yeah? Okay, then. Uh, then it's fine. Yeah, but it's still something changed. Okay, doesn't matter. If you can hear me, yeah, that should be fine. Uh, so that in some sense, at least human being uh, is capable of authentic creation. What it means, how uh, we can think uh, of, the, of, of these ideas, that's, that's of course something for, for another and much longer um, discussion. But if we take these ideas seriously, that means that human creativity is somehow related also with our soteriological concerns. That it's not just something that we do in addition to being human, but that being creative in an ontological sense, whatever that means, uh, somehow participates in who we are eschatologically, in who we are as people in the kingdom of God, as human beings in the kingdom of God, as the only a real criterion for Christians and Christian theology. That also means that human creativity can and should participate in new creation. And this is also going back to the uh, previously discussed concept of how, what it means uh, when God says, uh, let us create. Uh, well, whatever that means when Christians uh, think of it, I think it should mean co-creation, a creation where we as human beings participate in and are not objects that of, of somebody else, else's creation, including God. Uh, and I think that is a very fundamental distinction between Christian approach to the kingdom of God to many other ideas of some heavenly existence because if that kingdom of God is not the result of our creation, of our participation in it, it will be just another cage. It will be just another world we are stuck with, but is not something that we participated in as images of God. And this is the book that was mentioned at the beginning. If you're interested in some of these ideas uh, or some of the references that I use, you can find it uh, here and I'll be interested in your comments and further discussion if you find some of these points interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can. So we, can, we, we can take a, a couple of questions uh, to Professor Jalta. Thank you, Dever, for so uh, thought-provoking for such a thought-provoking talk, and it is connected to my topic, 
on so many levels that I can happily reduce my tomorrow talk to one third of it yeah, and let people free. <laughs> so, um, but one, uh, I have many questions to you, but one is you put uh, uh, this subjectivity and individualism into one package, kind of united it. But uh, according to um, Berdeev mentioned to you, he divides these two and condemns one and actually uh, writes on subjectivity quite a lot, uh, seeing a um, positive side of it. So I, I would like to hear mm -hmm. something about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yes, but Berger uh, doesn't do that consistently. So at some places he kind of identifies, he, he, he criticizes individuality, uh, and at other places he praises it and kind of links it with, uh, with the personal uh, approach, person, and uh, what we would nowadays, after Zizulas, call personhood. Uh, so uh, it's clear what he is trying to say in each given context. So he also wants to kind of distance himself from uh, that kind of subjectivity or individuality which places an individual as a kind of uh, essence in itself outside of society, which one can see reflections of, of um, the Slavophile uh, movement 19th century where that in many cases tried to do the same, to say like how a human being is always part of, of this society and, and there is this uh, uh, creation of our identity as individual human beings, not in opposition to others, but actually with others, which is what Zizulas uh, would eventually articulate as individual versus personhood. So I think Berjaev is saying very similar thing. But uh, so what I was trying to address there was not specifically in that line Berjaev, but rather this modern obsession with individuality and also subjectivity sometimes used uh, interchangeably uh, to say that uh, what defines us as human being are primarily our specific individual uh, properties like my reason, my feelings, uh, my ideas and so on and so forth. And that that is uh, something that was linked with the idea of art and artistic creation that some of us uh, possess this quality for creative uh, work talent or whatever you want to call it, and that's part of who you are as an individual, and that's what allows you to create, also sometimes called genius. And the rest of the talk was to actually point to what are the problems with that idea, and that in a theological context, actually, if we are serious about human creativity, it needs to be part of the Imago Dei, and that means that we all, by the virtue of being human beings, have creative, creative potential. Okay, that's it, thanks. Thank